All right, well, we'll get we'll get started and let people join us as they arrive. So Amahitlu, good morning. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, my name is Andrea Reed. I'm a proud citizen and member of the Niska Nation, and I'm an assistant professor here in the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries at the University of British Columbia. And I'm also the principal investigator for our newest unit here in the IOF. Um, the Center for Indigenous Fisheries, and it is my super pleasure to, to share this hosting responsibility today with fellow member of the Center, Alex Duncan, who's our first PhD student um, in the Center, and I have the privilege of working alongside and guiding this colleague of mine, so happy to be here with him. Um, so I'm going to give a brief little lead in and then pass things over to Alex to, to introduce our, our guest speakers. So many of us are joining from within and around the city now known as Vancouver on the territories of the Hamasquim, the tsleil the Skohomish, Katsi, Kwantlen, Coquitlam, Tawasin, the territories of the Hunkaminam and Skohomish speaking peoples. Where UBC is situated, it's Point Grey, Point, Point Grey campus, I can't speak this morning, uh, is located on Musqueam territory. And I'm told by friends in the nation that this is land that has always been a site of intergenerational learning, where youth have been learning from elders about their language, weaving, harvesting, and many other culture-defining practices, while warriors were out on the surrounding waters defending the territory. So we work and learn here today in a settler-run educational institution on Indigenous lands and waters, so we must really work hard to be in right relations with our host nation. So please ask yourself what this sometimes hidden reality might mean for you in the work you do and in the life you live. Uh, thanks, Andrea. Well, yeah, so I'm pleased to be introducing our wonderful speakers today, Dr. Jessica Black and Dr. Courtney Crothers. Dr. Black is Gwich'in from the villages of Gwich'yazi and Togotali in Alaska. Dr. Black currently serves as an associate professor in the Department of Alaska Native Studies, Rural Development, and Tribal Governance at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. She received her bachelor's degree in social work at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and her master's degree and PhD in social work at Washington University in St. Louis. Her dissertation and current research examine the relationship between governance and well-being among Alaska Native peoples, especially as it pertains to tri tribal stewardship and cultural connectivity. She resides in Fairbanks, Alaska with her family. However, she frequently returns home to Gwich'yazi to hunt, fish, gather, and engage in other important cultural practices. Dr. Carruthers is a professor of fisheries in the College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. She holds a PhD and an MA in environmental anthropology from the University of Washington and a BA in biology from Cornell University. Dr. Carruthers has devoted her career to working with fishing communities across Alaska to better understand the social and cultural dimensions of fishery systems and to improve education, research, and policy processes to better include these dimensions. She partners with Indigenous communities to promote social and environmental justice goals. She has served on a number of international, national, and state boards and working groups. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Black and Dr. Carruthers for their presentation about Demanda. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Bon Gwinzi, good morning in my language. It's wonderful to be here with you all and just enter in this space as um, Dr. Reed and Alex were talking, I was just overcome with emotion to think about, you know, just why we're here today. And then uh, Dr. Reed, when you were talking about all of the indigenous peoples um, who have stewarded and continue to steward the lands that is now Vancouver and British Columbia is just such a powerful image. It, it just came in my mind. So thank you for inviting us. We're so glad to be here. The title of our talk is Paddling Our Canoes, Own Canoes, Indigenous Governance and Well-Being. And I just want to say, you know, you often see pictures, but maybe not necessarily description. I'll just briefly say I love this picture. It comes from the Alaska Digital Archives, and these are three Native men. And for me, they have a, a very defined purpose and intention. And yet you can see just in the way they're dressed, this dynamic nature of being and purpose. And um, it just brings a lot of good feelings when I see these types of pictures as I try to recall my own history 
um, and what motivates the work I do, knowing that so much of my history was told through the lens of other people who didn't necessarily have my best interest. So I like to think about our own stories and what these men were doing and um, piece that together from oral histories and, and the history of my ancestors. We'd like to start by um, doing a land acknowledgement. We talk about land. This quote is very powerful. When we talk about land, land is part of who we are. It's a mixture of our blood, our past, our current, and our future. We carry our ancestors in us, and they are around us, as you all do. And that's from Mary Lyons from the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. And Alaska is the home of over 200 federally recognized tribes and over 12 language families. My family, Gwichaje, Gwitsun, I'm from Fort Yukon, we are Gwichin. So our territories span Northeast Alaska and Canada. We have a lot of um, our relatives in Yukon territories and I, actually all across Canada, but this border this uh, border that was created has made it more difficult for us to visit and share food and things, but we know the truth of like who we are. So but I am honored to live and work on the traditional homelands of the lower Tanana Dene Chinahutani people. And I am so grateful for their past, present and future stewardship of these beautiful lands. When I work on our campus, it is absolutely clear to me that with the utmost care and respect, they have stewarded these lands. So I'd like to recognize them. Courtney? Yes, good morning, everyone. I'm Courtney, and we'll introduce ourselves in just a minute. Um, I wanted to start with an acknowledgement as well. I come here uh, to Alaska as a white settler. Uh, I live in Dagayakuk, which is Anchorage, Alaska on Denina lands. And I'm, you know, as a faculty member and a settler here, I, I really um, think it's my responsibility to live in, in better relation. Um, Andrea, I really loved your opening words and thinking a lot about how the indigenous history and present of the state of Alaska has been erased and continues to be erased in, in the spaces that we live and work in. And what is my role as a non-native person here who's trying to do better and, and bring up my kids and in, in, in the work I do, the students that I teach, centering indigenous stewardship and sovereignty. And we recognize here in Alaska, you know, 14,000 plus years, you know, um, time immemorial of stewardship and care um, that has made these lands and, and all relations um, so rich. And, and we have the current system that's really threatening so much of that. So I, I give my um, yeah humble acknowledgement and, and solidarity with um, indigenous sovereignty movements um, here in Alaska and, and really uplift um, the long-term and ongoing stewardship of indigenous peoples here. And we invite you all to introduce yourself in the chat and whose traditional indigenous lands you reside on because everywhere on Turtle Island was is indigenous lands. Um, we will do a brief introduction. I mentioned in my intro, and thank you, Alex, for uh, sharing my traditional homelands, uh, Gwichaje, Fort Yukon, and Tagatili, Ninana. Um, I was raised in a very uh, rich cultural upbringing. I was fortunate, although as a child, you don't necessarily know how fortunate you are, but my was raised with my grandparents, my great grandparents, my parents, and we had very um, humble, home and life, but a very rich one um, along the banks of the Yukon River. And we didn't have much in terms of money, but we were rich in our culture. Um, my grandparents were fisher people and they raised us up that way. And that has absolutely created the strongest foundation from which I am able to navigate life. Yes, I did have immense challenges as an indigenous person in this world, I absolutely did. And then within my own family system, adapting to uh, colonization and all of its impacts. But those early foundations along the Yukon River, along our fish camp, 
and learning to become a Gwich'in person um, has really helped me navigate those challenges. And that is what I want to see for all future generations. For my daughter in the upper left, who's putting a handful of blueberries in her mouth with like the utmost love um, to Courtney's beautiful daughters in these pictures as well, that they have a life where our rich and beautiful lands continue to provide for and with us as we live in good relations. So, um, Courtney. Thank you, Jess. Yeah, it's it's my deep honor to, to work alongside you in, in this work. And as I mentioned, I come as a settler here. I was raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My lineage is, is mostly in Ireland and, and um, Wales and England but really grew up in a working class um, community um, neighborhood in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I was um, fortuitously um, brought west and, and north. And I, I really owe, I think, where I'm at in life today to the village of Old Harbor, which is um, pictured behind me in that top image. Um, it's a Sukpiak Alutic village in the Kodiak Archipelago. And that's where I was um, based for my dissertation work in, uh, in the early 2000s and that community really welcomed me in. I got to, to live with an elder and really just dramatically shaped my life path and, and learning so much about the intimate relationships and, and deep stewardship of, of lands and waters in, in the Kodiak region and the severe dispossession that uh, Western policies have had on those fishing ways of life and how they're still, that story is still, still being mistold in my opinion about uh, the dispossession of, of fishing rights from Kodiak and other communities in Alaska. But I was, yeah, very captivated and, and welcomed um, into the community and got my job at UAF, University of Alaska Fairbanks, but I am based in Degayakuk Anchorage um, about, yeah, 14 years ago. So I've, I've been a professor of fisheries. Um, as Alex mentioned, my, my field is anthropology and sort of critical political ecology. Um, and so it's Amazing, I was hired in our fisheries faculty and have really been trying to do um, some work to transform that discipline. Um, and my two daughters here, Sola is the older one, she just turned eight and Annika is six. And we, I, I think this this work is so, th that we'll speak about today is, is really exciting and indigenous led, and we have non-indigenous members of our team. And we reflect a lot about what are the appropriate roles for us as allies in this work and like what's, so I think about this on a daily basis in my work, but also in bringing up my kids. Um, and so we, we do a lot of, um, I don't know, emerging thought around bringing up um, settler children in Anchorage today. What does that look like? What is my responsibility? And anyway, I'm just not at all an expert in any of that, but I am committed to uh, working alongside um, indigenous leaders to help find my place in, in that work in a good way. Awesome, thanks, Courtney. Yeah, so, you know, um, just kind of diving right into it here, you know, here in Alaska, there's thousands of years of indigenous presence, stewardship and care. And I remember growing up, I knew that because my grandparents had told us about our relatives and we have great stories of our leaders who survived, um, many harsh conditions there's a I wish I had more time today because I could tell you a really amazing story from one of my elders that I got permission to share but just great hardship and they survived and um, because they lived in such close relationship to the land and and so that I could be here today so we have these amazing stories and knowledge of our history and our ancestors but you know, that concept of how long we've been here as Indigenous people across the world has always been challenged by Western academia and thought. Um, and now I put these pictures up because there has been this emergence of, um, you know, ancient remains found in Alaska that shed light on how humans populated the Americas certain beads found that predate the arrival of Columbus. There was a body of a child found in the Tanana River Basin that confirmed indigenous people indeed were here, um, which, you know, I always knew that from my own people, but, um, you know, there's a lot more narrative around that time frame, And I remember going to a, I don't know if it was conference, I think Courtney was there, we do a lot of racial equity work in fisheries, and one of 
the presenters talked about how you just knew there was indigenous presence because of how pristine the lands were on which you, you know, were if you were to go camping or if you were in like outside a village, there was just it was it would look so well cared for and and that to them was the presence of indigenous people and so um here in alaska 14,000 plus years and that special unique spiritual relationship exists yet today and in that spiritual connection is so powerful and in, in intimate and yet it's so challenged in many ways. And I'll get more into that a little bit later, but just wanted to like reference and anchor us to this thought of thousands of years of indigenous stewardship and care. And a lot of that, I think you might, might resonate with many of you because it's based upon indigenous values. Yes, we are all unique, our tribes, our people, but we share common values across many of us, um, relationality with not just each other as people, but our non-human relatives, the water which gives us life, the land which provides, if you were just to put your feet down right now in your office, wherever you're sitting, you and you were to think about it for 30 seconds, you will feel a deep sense of rootedness to mother earth. And you can imagine her reaching up with intention and grounding you to this place you're in right now as a way to offer peace and connection, responsibility to your community, to your non-human relatives, to the water, to the earth. Reciprocity, this cyclical obligation um, that keeps communities healthy and well, to, that keeps the fish healthy and well, that keeps us healthy and well a redistribution and sharing. And we'll talk about these values um, that make indigenous life and stewardship and meaning so different. Um, and how can we bring that into the world in a way that is respected and honored? I have, Andrea, you quoted here, but um, it's, you know, I was, was putting some slides together and I just wanted to like demonstrate because you know I speak to so many non native audiences and as an indigenous person I'm often like questioned a lot about like how do you know these things you know to be true, how is this connection so deep in how, how do these things like practically play out, how do you put them into action, um, but if you look around the world indigenous people are stewarding lands. Um, they are, you know, um, act, serving as activists to speak for those that cannot speak for themselves, um, defending rich biodiverse habitats because of that deep relationality, um, not, you know, because of other things, but because of that close spiritual connection that I spoke about, because of that reciprocity because of that sharing obligation. So when we think about these examples, they're all around us, they're all around the world, but sometimes we have to pull them together to sort of in a way defend what we're saying. But I think they're beautiful examples of the ongoing stewardship. And even in places, I've been to other countries where there isn't formal recognition of indigenous people and yet they are inherently sovereign and self-determined and they are acting upon that for the best outcomes of not only human beings, but again, they're non-human kin, water, land, animals. And a lot of my dissertation work looks at the relationship between governance, our, our sovereignty, as tribal people and well being, and especially as it pertains to natural resources, I like to call them our relatives. Resources just feel so transactional, but, um, and our well being. So the ability to hunt, fish, and gather is not just about putting food in our freezer, but it's about that me teaching my daughter how to respectfully harvest berries, to thank the plants, to ensure that they're protected. 
um, and how to be confident in herself as a little indigenous person in this world um, to connect with my mother and heal some of the things that she went through while out on the land. So yes, hunting, fishing, gathering is associated with well-being because it's been our way of life for 10,000 years. That's a quote from one of the participants of my dissertation. Um, and this second quote, I won't read it to you, but um, the elder was talking about how when you are get out on the land, it helps the land. And when you help the land, it helps you. It's like this reciprocity. Next slide. So what is the problem, right? We, we have 10,000 years of stewardship and care. And yet here in Alaska, we are criminalized for our way of life. We've seen declining fish populations. I'm sure that may be something that you can relate to where you live. Our Chinook or our Thukcho, we call them our king salmon and our chum salmon are um, really suffering. And the people who have been uh, limited the most are indigenous people. We have 1% of the overall harvest and we're the most regulated by state and federal government and criminalized, ticketed, fined for living our way of life. And so um, these are some of the, the uh, publications, Survival Denied, you could just find that online. And then I wrote a piece uh, with Carrie Stevens, I am a crim criminal criminalization of indigenous fishing practices. And this work has really come from my heart because I've seen my own people internalize this oppression and it leads to other things like a lack of well being for living their way of life, for living my way of life. So um, I don't want to read this quote, I'm, I'm mindful of time, but we will share the slide deck with you, Andrea, and you can uh, share it with others because there's some really powerful quotes. In this quote, one of our partners just talks about the first time she remembers hearing the government, the Alaska Department of Fishing Game, she was really little and she remembers that she like wanted to, um, she was so scared because she didn't want to get caught robbing the creek and just as a little child internalizing that oppression. Yeah, and these are just examples. These are some news articles um, talking about, you know, criminalization of fishing, restoration of fishing rights. Um, most recently with the COVID-19 pandemic, the organized village of Cake went before the federal subsistence board and asked for a special action request to hunt a moose, um, you know, out of season to feed the village because they weren't there. Were, their ferries quit coming and there was no way to get them food. They were approved to do it, and the state of Alaska sued the federal subsistence board for approving that special action request. It went to the courts, and it was decided to in favor of the organized village of cake, but you can see the ongoing like burden of carrying such criminalization. And what does that mean for being able to tr transmit culture and cultural continuity and, and just like wearing down of the soul? Yeah, thank you, Jess. I just will transition to the next slide in just a minute, but on that lawsuit, it really struck me um, in the time of the pandemic, you know, hunting a, a moose or, you know, provisioning for a community that, that our state would create a lawsuit. We've had a budget crisis. We don't have any money to be suing the federal government. And all of the former commissioners of our Alaska Department of State Fish and Game wrote an opinion piece in support of that lawsuit for one tribe getting one moose. That was worth a lawsuit. And it just, it's shocking to me as, again, a non-Native person, I come at this with naivete and privilege, but it was to me an egregious example of criminalization in a way that again is, is invisible um, to, to, to white people, to, to settlers here, um, because sport hunting is, is the supreme um, use of, of you know, the resource. Um, this is a passionate topic for me. I studied um, limited entry and um, individual fishing quotas uh, as a dissertation topic and really have continued that work for the past couple decades. Um, to me, this is a huge crisis in Alaska. I know in British Columbia as well, you have many scholars um, 
Evelyn Pinkerton, um, Charles Menzies, Caroline Butler, many others have, have been really studying and, and publishing on these topics um, in your context as well. But in Alaska, there's been a such a large dispossession of indigenous fishing rights that have accompanied the commodification um, and, and market-based policy of, of limited entry um, permits and, and fishing quotas. And, and the, the dominant narrative on this is there's nothing wrong with these policies. There's only things wrong with, with the people or the communities you know, that, that can't get with the program and, and figure out how to operate in these highly capitalized fisheries. Um, there's been a large um, outflow of, of fishing livelihoods from most Alaska Native villages across um, Alaska. This is another example of indigenous erasure. We have in our um, state you know, data, um, we have rural. There isn't a tracking of, of indigenous participation. There's a tracking of rural. And that's you know, 229 rural um, tribes in Alaska. Um, so anyway, th there's um, a, a large problem here. And this is a coming in as a naive dissertation student. Um, I figured collecting all this data and, and making it accessible, publishing, you know, dozens of papers, working with colleagues to really situate this issue as, as one of, of the problem of the policy would make a difference. And it hasn't at all, which is really um, sad to me. And but 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 stoking the fire all the same. Um, to hear elders um, and, and, you know, adult men and others talk about growing up in their communities, in their villages, living their um, fishing ways of life, you know, um, and how that really cut off um, this one quote, anyone who does ethnographic work, you know, you have thousands and thousands of pages of, of text data. And this one quote, it all started with the permit for me was this aha moment these radical changes in fishing livelihoods weren't about people, you know, not getting with the program or people not working hard. They were about the permit. And that is a, a truth uh, that's still denied, I'd say, in the dominant like fisheries science. I, I teach, um, so, you know, social science. I teach about social and cultural dimensions of fisheries a lot to fishery science students. And they take my classes and they'll you know, start learning some of the social and cultural impacts of these privatization policies. And they'll say things like, this is like learning there's no Santa or like, what do you, like, this is such dogma, you know, in e ecology, tragedy, the commons, you know, people can't manage fish without a property, right? How would you ever, that's impossible. Well, you know, indigenous stewardship, it's, it was possible for, for tens of thousands of years. Um, it is possible, and, and, the, and the property thing has really created a huge problem. So I get excited on this topic, and I'm happy to share more on it. Um, I did a recent po podcast in the In Common podcast talking about some of this research, if anyone would, would be interested in that podcast to learn more. So we're, um, Dr. Black and I were really lucky to meet, I don't know, five or six years ago, we were brought together um, by a colleague and, and started some work together and, and we coalesced, you know, her research on well, indigenous well-being and governance and some of my work on fisheries privatization and, and the need to change the way we teach fishery science and do fishery science research came together and with a, with a large team and a lot of decades of leaders behind us, but we're trying to stand up these two projects that we hope are, you know, starting that transformation across education, research and governance uh, within our, our realm in Alaska. So we've got the DeMumpta program, which I'll speak to at the end in indigenizing salmon science and management that Jessica will speak to now. Yeah, so we're really fortunate, as Courtney mentioned, um, we entered together in a project called Indigenizing Salmon Science and Management. The uh, Mumta Ilala put, um, and it's it's been a beautiful process. I want to recognize our collective team here. Uh, we have advisors and partners and many elders who have graciously just guided us through all of this work with their indigenous knowledge and wisdom, Elder Wilson Justin, Elder Mike Williams, Freddie Christensen, um, just so many, and then several of our partners here. 
And really it's about documenting the breadth and depth of indigenous values, knowledge and governing systems connected to salmon across Alaska and using this wisdom to improve current salmon science and management processes for all. Because what you see in the policies doesn't reflect this rich, these rich knowledge systems dating back 10,000 plus years. And so that is the overarching goal. And we are very focused on engaging in Indigenous methodologies. Um, you know, I am the PI, but we have also really worked at building and strengthening ethical relationships across Alaska. So we have connected to local uh, Indigenous priorities and ongoing work. And we have students from different regions across Alaska, Indigenous students who are leading the work in their own region. And so that has been one of the most powerful parts of this is that we are connecting to work that's already being done and uplifting, amplifying, and just finding ways to get the resources to this ongoing work. And um, we do this through uh, interviews, circle dialogues. I had mentioned uh, we lead talks on racial equity. We were trained by First Alaskans Institute and they train people on leading Alaska Native Dialogues on Racial Equity and or. So we were trained to lead these difficult dialogues where you would invite people from very different perspectives and worldviews around a topic and work through a dialogue to better understand one another, but also to recognize the deep racial inequities that exist that lead to our current situations of dispossession and lack of fishing opportunities, and then cultural exchange and deep learning where you would invite someone maybe to a fish camp who hasn't been there and engage in several days of conversation and dialogue. Next slide. Um, and these are some of the main words that have shown up in these dialogues looking at the data. And um, I'll just leave it there. You can kind of look at the bolder words um, they they are like the frequency of what you know those topics and how much they're mentioned and we've led them all over alaska and the us uh, this one's in portland the multi-generational interviews are so powerful a very indigenous way of interacting except for you know here we are in the office doing it but like it was interesting. We started the conversation. It was grandparents, parents, and uh, grandchildren. And we were talking about um, like traditional fishing practices and like stewardship and care. And pretty soon Courtney and I became obsolete. They were just in their own conversation uh, together because it was just like story time. And it was just so beautiful to see them feeding off of each other and really engaged in the conversation. And then just thinking about what does the, this mean, you know, when you're looking at the data and um, just how we are able to make meaning of this data, you know, and we rely a lot on indigenous methodologies and uh, scholars who talk about like my, or I should say I, me, my own relation to this work, right? What is, are the ethics in terms of like um, reciprocity? I'm asking people to share very intimate parts of themselves around a topic that has like been very traumatic criminalization of our ways of life and like ongoing future of salmon, which is in peril, right? So um, just being mindful of that and my own positionality, um, a lot of times it ends up in conversation where the participants are asking me about my own relation to the work and like how I was raised. And, you know, you're kind of taught in Western academia, you're supposed to like separate yourself from like this objective look at the data and the research, but that is not a reality in indigenous relationships and research. So um, we spend a lot of time talking about this with ourselves, our team, our students, and meaning making becomes a very beautiful process versus like work, because it's it's about um, really taking serious into serious consideration the words that people are sharing from their heart. And the 
uh, primary themes um, coming out of the actual interviews, the multi-generational interviews and the dialogues, you can see the bold, bigger words um, are mentioned more frequently. And what this really tells you, and if you look at the transcripts, is that we are operating in a broken system that has criminalized Indigenous people. And it is there is a deep yearning and it's hard. Okay, here I am talking about it from the data perspective, but this is me, right? Like this is my way of life. So this worry about intergenerational transmission of knowledge, how much does my daughter lose out on because of policies that restrict our way of life? How does, is our culture defined? What power do I have anyways as an indigenous person? Virtually none. Um, so, you know, these words, they really stand out to me and they, they impact me so deeply because this is me, right? Like I'm looking at data that reflects who I am and my people. Um, just, I don't think we have time, like we're at 40, but maybe I'll read this quote and then kick it to you, Courtney. Um, I feel with our traditional upbringing and teachings, they come, the salmon come back to the river for a reason. And I think it's because we've taken care of them just as much as they've taken care of us. And there is this relationship between people and salmon that's been documented for thousands of years and that's still alive today. So it's a strong relationship between indigenous peoples and salmon, you know, it has sustained life. It was sustained culture. It's sustaining my own traditional practices because with the history and the trauma and the assimilation that has happened here in Alaska, I don't speak my language, but I connect strongly to my culture and my tradition through salmon. And I think that's my strongest identity as an indigenous person is being a traditional fisherwoman, fisherman, fisher person. And um, just a quick note before I turn it to you, Courtney, um, or we can, we can both um, proceed, but I was visiting with two of my students last night because I'm, I'm somewhere else, I'm not at home, I'm in a hotel room, but they came to visit and they, thank you. And we're talking and they were talking about um, muskrats, which are little animals um, in the beaver family, you might know, but, but they are, their furs are used to make really beautiful warm parkas and, um, and they're very, they taste very good. But that they were talking, my students, about how back in the day there were tens of thousands of muskrats and people would harvest a ton of muskrat because it was a really nice springtime food when all of your other food you had eaten and you'd make beautiful parkas with it. And then people stopped trapping as many muskrat and um, because of policies and other things that limited it and the, and the muskrat population like took a nosedive too. And so the students were talking about, yeah, and so, you know, like they really need us to like, when they gift themselves to be able to harvest them so that they keep coming back. And maybe that's why the, you know, they were just like really thinking about like the salmon and the relationship and just that inability to be who they are. And so it was just a beautiful example of, of, you know, how that we take care of them, they take care of us and they rely on us too receive the gift when we're given it. Yeah, and then just, you know, there is a deep need for tribal governance because this quote, they are out of touch with what we need, just not the recognition of not only, it's not just about food in our freezer, but this deep relationships between generations and sharing of culture. And a lot of it is, you know, the management is, is not really in line with traditional time of fishing and restrictions. Yesterday, someone talked about how the salmon come in with that cold glacial water and the wind and, and, you know, like a set date for fishing is just not like what you're looking for. You're looking for very, um, the butterflies that, that come in swarms and, um, a certain bird that will sing a song to you three times. And in that, when they sing the, these words to you three times, you have to set your net within 24 hours because that's like a pulse. So just that not being in timing with fishing and restrictions and then just no value in spirituality, like not talked about at all. It's sort of like, if you even bring it up, people are like, oh, I don't know, that's not really science. And, you know, just a very much um, 
you know, I don't know how to say it other than not recognizing the value of it. And it's really thought of as like a job management versus a way of life and it's exclusionary nature. We can keep going, Courtney. Thank you, Jess. Yeah, um, so exciting um, that that project. And as we're yeah, kind of in the midst of um, looking at all of the amazing interviews, it's just been really um, yeah hard, but also uplifting to to really bring everything together. Um, we wanted to introduce this other project, um, and yeah, I know we're we're um, we've got about seven minutes, so we will be on time to end. Um, Demumpta, um, this is a new project funded through our US National Science Foundation that largely is supporting graduate students, indigenous graduate students to be getting their masters and PhDs in fisheries and marine sciences at UAF. And we have a large and growing team, which we're really excited about. And we're able to give a talk, I think, at your Canadian fish meetings recently on this. Um, so thank you for that invitation to, to share there as well. So in addition to all of the work we've been doing on transforming fishery systems, um, there's such a problem with um, the educational um, systems. I, I think, again, as Andrea was introducing, the, the settler-run institutions, right? And I think we, in our College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences, which may be similar to your institute, um, we have a lot of faculty who are yeah, trained in Western sciences and don't think about Western approaches you know coming out of of european uh, ways of knowing as a knowledge system they think of them as universal like or or, or the best you know way of of thinking and so there's a, a the experience of indigenous students on our campus um the the sort of ongoing erasure we have um as jessica said the the um Trothieta campus in fairbanks on the homelands of the lower tanana Dene peoples we have indigenous students in our fishery classes in their homelands with no recognition of them as people, of them as stewards, of their of their presence and stewardship, and we have been able to um, gather, you know, some stories and testimonials from Indigenous students uh, about how much our university needs to change. And we're really excited. There's there's movement going on um, larger than our project, but our project is is really trying to focus on the fisheries and marine um, sciences in particular. So. Our goals are to transform how we teach, um, how we teach students, and a lot of that has to do with work with faculty. Um, the the primary support, um, our funding primarily supports um, graduate students to to get their degrees, um, and we are trying to work across our university and with um, state, federal, and tribal partners to kind of bring this reach out from from our university to across the state. We have an all indigenous amazing uh, cohort one, um, nine scholars here from across um, the lands of Alaska, um, really already leaders and already changing things in their work, but bringing them together as a cohort and creating space um, to, to build that solidarity has been amazing. And again, as a non-native person, I'm like so incredibly honored to be able to take part in this transformation and, and sort of um, listen as these scholars and scientists really show the path forward that, that we need. We are um, doing a lot, a lot of moving pieces. Um, Dr. Black and I were able to put a, a course together, Indigenous Fisheries of Alaska. It's the first class in our department that has ever, you know, had the word indigenous in it or, or you know, really ever centered um, indigenous knowledge systems of fisheries, which again is, is quite shocking and, and in itself, we are trying to bring elders into all of the work that we do um, in many different ways. Um, we're hoping, yeah, Dr. Reed might come as a vis visiting scholar. Um, we're trying to invite um, scholars to help, indigenous scholars to help us um, think through what we're doing and, and mentor and be available to our students as, as mentors and guides as well. We have a lot of um, uh, retreat time and time and place, time and community um, as, you know, these pandemic times hopefully change. We're, we're hoping to bring students in, in for deep learning, land-based pedagogies, indigenous pedagogies, and also to bring some of the state and federal partners that we're trying to develop deeper relationships to for deep learning for them so they can really understand the impacts their policies have on people. We're continuing this dialogue work. I see transformations from this dialogue work 
um, really starting to take hold. It's like long-term work, but the more that you can engage people multiple times in some of this work, I think they, they really start becoming aware of, of it and offering short courses and trainings for our, again, federal and state partners are starting to request us to host these dialogues or to prepare classes, short classes for them. Um, and that's something we're, yeah, really offering and, and really want to um, uh, acknowledge here uh, Abayuk Moore, a Yupik artist who branded our logo um, and, and created this painting, Demumpta, for our project. And it's, again, we're trying to um, decolonize, indigenize our space a bit. Um, and we, we have a long way to go on that, but really excited to, to feature this amazing painting representing um, people and fish and land in, in a beautiful way. So to wrap up here, we're so thankful for your attention for, for this talk. And we really want to, um, you know, again, situate the need for the first, the recognition of this indigenous erasure and exclusion and in the sciences and in our academic institutions, there's still a lot of invisible, you know, I call it invisible invisibility. You know, the Eurocentrism and it is so prevalent that it, it parades around as if it's, yeah, again, the only way of thinking or that it's value free. You know, it's, it's value free because it has the values of Western European ontologies and epistemologies. It's not value free. It's a, you know, it's a certain kind of value and, and it's a, it, and based on a certain kind of spirituality. So we really try to um, work with an understanding that there are a multiplicity of knowledge systems and there's a long his, historical colonial and ongoing power imbalance. And we try to elevate indigenous knowledge systems to work alongside Western systems and work with Western scientists to kind of teach them about this, this, these systems that they may not be aware of. Um, and certainly the recognition of um, indigenous peoples and tribal sovereignty. We still have scientists in our trying to remake research relationships. We work with fishery scientists who we get into um, tension with, you know, they're working in tribal communities and they don't think they need to approach the tribal government for uh, permission. That's not required for our fish scientists. It's required for social scientists, but not, you know, natural scientists. So we're trying to institutionalize norms and and, pro and indigenous protocols for how to respectfully engage tribal sovereigns in in research and in the work that we're doing. Um, and yeah, really, I already mentioned um, kind of recognizing the multiplicity of languages and, or sorry, of, of knowledge systems and languages and, and approaches and making space for them. We want to say a, a big Masicho Guyana to um, our funders. NSF is the major funder of both of those projects and have a lot of partners that have helped us develop the, this work and, and make it a success. And we have some references here at the end. And we'll share these slides with everyone as well. So thank you so much for your time and attention and invitation to join today. Thank you so much both for, um, for making time to come to speak with us today. Um, and thank you so much for your incredibly powerful presentations and also for truly the gift um, of sharing your, your personal reflections, particularly you, Jessica. And um, yeah, so I don't take this Easily, as in, like it's it's a it's a, I really truly take it as a gift, um, and so it's a it's been a very special presentation, and I'm really grateful for you making time today and to share the space with us. Um, so this is now our Q and A, and so I invite anyone to either raise their hand um, to ask a question, or if you prefer, you can put it in a chat box as well, and then we can either ask it on your behalf, um, or we can turn to you to ask it by yourself. Matt, please go ahead. Unfortunately, I can't hear you, Matt, unfortunately. You're unmuted, but I cannot hear you. Maybe because your headphones are on, I don't know. Bluetooth, I, I'm trying to figure that out. Thank you, Matt, and sorry about that. Um, feel free otherwise to, um, 
to type out your chat if for some reason you don't figure out your audio and then we can um, Jessica and Courtney can read out your question or we can read it out, out on your behalf. Andrea, go ahead, please. I'm filled with like days, weeks, and months worth of things to talk about. So I think we'll have to continue this conversation, but that was really wonderful. Thank you both so much for sharing. And I think, yeah, just given everything that's been shared in the chat, I think there's a lot of gratitude among everyone listening. So thanks. Um, I have one comment, which is, Jocelyn Joe Strack, I don't think your paths have crossed yet, but Jocelyn would be a wonderful person to consider as a visiting scholar and what she's doing at UConn University parallels so closely what you are doing, what we are doing here and our ability to work together, I think will really strengthen what we're able to do. Um, so I would be very happy to facilitate that connection if, if of interest. Um, I was curious about the racial equity work that you've been doing and you've been translating that outside of Alaska Native context, you mentioned, I think, Oregon. Um, does that does that cross context well, or is it really about focusing in on Alaska Native kind of context and experience? Yeah, I can go and then Courtney can jump in. So the way it's set up, you could pretty much do it across context. It's all around like the topic you want to cover. So ours was racial equity and fisheries. And um, I think one of the most important parts of it is there's a set of dialogue agreements. Maybe we can pop that into the chat, Courtney, but there's a set of dialogue agreements and you, you, we actually spend a lot of time going over them. So it's like in every chair leader, speak to be understood or let's see, speak to be understood, listen to understand, uh, takest thou hat off, which you know many of us have many roles. Um, there's there's a bunch of them so we spend time grounding everyone in those and then in order to proceed people have to agree to the agreements right and so um and we're sitting in a circle but we could also do this on zoom and we pose like sets of questions so there's all kinds of things you can do so like you you really are intentional about setting the context and then you bring in like the hot issues, right? So racial equity and fisheries. And so we might have what's called a fishbowl where you have four people in the center and they're speaking about their experience of racism in fisheries. And everybody outside the circle can only listen. They cannot interrupt. They And then we have a debriefing of that, um, not to weigh in on its truth, but to, you know, dialogue about what they heard. And, um, and I will tell you this, that not everybody walks away in agreement or happy, but everybody walks away knowing something different and they can't unknow what they've heard. And so um, it is something that's very powerful. And, but, you know, it's, it's, it's very, um, it's something you have to be trained in because it can go a different way if you don't set the tone correctly. And, you know, for example, with the circle dialogue, some people are like, no, no, I'll sit in the back, I'm fine. And we're like, well, in order to participate in this, you have to join the circle or you need to leave. Um, that's hard to say to someone, right? And so they have to agree right off the bat to be a part of it. So it does span context, but you really have to frame it in a way. And it was very helpful that we were trained. Courtney? Yeah, th thanks, thanks, Jessica, and thanks, Andrea, for the question. And I want to recognize as well, Dr. Sonia Ibarra is joining us. Gracias, Sonia, from our Demumta program, and uh, really nice to see you. Um, yes, I think the um, the I, I put a couple links in the chat for that dialogue set of dialogue agreements. I use those in my teaching and, and conversation in general. And then um, First Alaskans Institute has a whole website on their program of Alaska Native Dialogues on Racial Equity, and so there's example flows of how you might, you know, convene such a discussion and, and definitely agree it's important to have training about hosting those. But I think within the fisheries context, we just hosted one with our American Fisheries Society Alaska chapter a couple of weeks ago. We had over 100 people on Zoom. Um, I would say largely non-native, you know, fish scientists and, and agency folks. Um, 
but we did a fishbowl, like Jessica mentioned, um, an all indigenous fishbowl. And I think the way, the, the sort of whole approach here is that learning is so much deeper, gathering and listening to our lived experiences and sharing them, you know, in, in a good way and in, a, in an intentional way that learning is so much deeper than like, you know, a training on, on racism. You know, we, we have so many people in Alaska that deny that racism exists or that colonialism is ongoing, that they come with a very defensive um, stance on this. And I mean, this is part of our larger kind of world right now and a lot of reflection on this, but these stories um, are really powerful for learning. And we also, I think that they are a space of also healing and, and sharing trauma um, that is also part of this work. So it's 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 sort of deep learning, deep listening, and um, just to mention real quickly as well, First Alaskans Institute is also leading a um, truth, racial um, healing, and transformation process, and they're standing up a lot of tribunals where these stories are being told in a very again kind of um, intentional way. And they'll, they'll be made public. Um, there was just one on boarding schools. There was one on protecting our ways of life. And it's a very deep um, learning um, opportunity for, for folks that might want to learn more. And again, uh, a very, I think, intentional healing space for some of the ongoing traumas that um, Indigenous peoples have experienced. Thank you. Um, Matt, I wanted to make sure that we have a little space for your question. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. So maybe Jessica or Courtney, if you have quick reflections on Matt's question posted in the in the chat. Um, otherwise, I'm happy to read it out um, if you have yeah, a chance. I read it and I completely agree. Um, how, like you, how you said, you know, but it's so easy for these to be assimilated into a Western management paradigm as opposed to a true two-eyed seeing approach. Does there need to be need to first be a real power shift from colonial governments that's legally binding. Yes, and you know, Matt, I didn't get to share this indigenous governance spectrum, but I was, I teach, um, that, that was created by Carrie Stevens and Kevin Illingworth professors in tribal governance. And I actually go over it with my students and it like does require policy shifts, but, um, we're, you know, like co-management is even like, um, is kind of touted as like the ideal, whereas most indigenous peoples in Alaska were seeking full indigenous self-governance. And that's at the very top of the spectrum, but we're not even at co-management at this. I mean, there are co-management agreements within the Marine Mammal Protection Act and some of the marine species, but, um, like in other areas, there's not. And so, and and there is with fisheries in the Cuscoquim River Intertribal Fish Commission, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, but in other areas, there's no co-management. So we're kind of like more at the bottom and we're seeking a path to true indigenous self-governance. And I'm mindful of the time. I apologize to those who um, we didn't get to questions. I don't know how you wanna structure that Colette, but. Um, we always encourage folks to also reach out to us to for any questions they didn't uh, get to ask, and then we'll forward them to you, and then you um, feel free to respond either to us directly or to the folks who have asked the question. Um, so I will otherwise pass it on to Andrea, and apologies for anyone we may have broken, uh, like we have not had a chance to turn to to wrap it up. Okay, we'll wrap it up there and Fish 500 students will stay on with, with Jessica and Courtney. Please join me in thanking them both once again for, for being with us. So grateful.